Hello, how are you? Have, very excited to see everybody today. We're gonna give people just a few minutes to settle in while we wait for everyone to join. Um, it's very exciting. This program today is gonna to be so wonderful. Um, as a reminder, we're covering LinkedIn today as part of our Career Connection Workshop Series. You're gonna get the most out of this workshop if you move along in LinkedIn um, with our instructor. So please have your LinkedIn account open and available. We hope you're gonna be inspired to tweak it as you go. We've got uh, some great exercises to help you do that. We do not have time planned in this session for you to start a LinkedIn account. So if you don't have one yet, that's totally okay. You'll still get a lot out of the session that you can apply when you get moving on LinkedIn. Looks like we are having people settle in, get into the Zoom room. This is fantastic. We'll have people join after we get started, which is great. It is such a pleasure to welcome you to our week-long Career Connection Workshop Series. Uh, my name is Beth Francesco. I'm the Senior Director for the National Press Club Journalism Institute. We conceptualized this week of learning as a chance for job seekers like you with any level of experience or any place in the process of job seeking to fine tune some of the key tools that employers and recruiters use to screen applicants. We're, we're all going to benefit from the insights today on how to leverage LinkedIn to maximize your active or passive job searches. Before I introduce our wonderful instructor, I have a few housekeeping items. We hope that you're gonna have a lot of questions. Um, as you have these questions, please ask them in the chat feature. It's at the bottom right of your Zoom screen. I'm gonna ask you now to take a minute, open up that chat window and where it says two, please use the drop down menu to, go to, to select panelists and attendees. That will make sure that uh, our panelists see it as well as the rest of the uh, students who are joining us for this class. Chances are, if you have a question, it's probably on somebody else's mind too. So it'll be great to share all of those at once. The other thing I'll ask is that again, if you can open up your LinkedIn account on your desktop or on your phone, you can follow along and make changes to your profile as we go. As a reminder, this is not a general how to use LinkedIn session. So if you've got some technical questions um, or just general questions about how to use LinkedIn, you can ask them. Um, we're probably going to save them for the end of the program and try to get to them if we have time. We're really focusing on using LinkedIn in your journalism job search. And at the end of this program, uh, you will receive a survey, a link to a survey in the chat. We're hoping that you will take a minute to respond to our prompt. Um, we really wanna know how we can, uh, what you learned and what you took away from today's program, as well as uh, how, what we can do to help you as you continue in your job search. So stay tuned after the program and don't log out immediately. I'm incredibly honored to introduce our expert instructor for today, Ms. Yumi Wilson. Ms. Wilson is a media writing professor at San Francisco State University and a guest lecturer at UC Berkeley. Previously, she worked as a journalist at the Associated Press and the San Francisco Chronicle. She's also worked at Yahoo News as a content producer and as a trainer for journalists at LinkedIn. She continues to offer branding and LinkedIn workshops like this one. Ms. Wilson has literally written a book on how journalists can maximize social media. Her most recent book, The Social Media Journalist Handbook, was published in 2019. It aims to help readers learn how to reach and engage with the maximum number of people, as well as find sources, raise their profile, conduct research, and produce stories. She's also co-authored a textbook, Writing and Reporting the News for the 21st Century. We are so, so honored to have you join us today, Ms. Wilson. Let's dive into LinkedIn. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here on the day that we call hump day. So we can knock this out. Um, I'm in the uh, West Coast, so it's only 9 a.m. here. Um, so let me just go ahead and jump into things and, and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. You'll see tons of windows open and it will be just lovely. Um, again, I won't be able to see the chat box, so Beth will be monitoring it for me. Um, if there's any problems, um, please let Beth uh, know. All right, I'm going to get started. So I'm calling this session Leveraging LinkedIn for Journalists. This session um, is really going to be focused on how each of you can, you know, can do things that will make your profile stand out. 
So a couple of statistics, there are tons of statistics and they're changing all the time. Um, you know, quarterly, they change poorly. So currently LinkedIn says it's up to nearly 770 million users. So that number has definitely increased from the time that I worked there a couple of years ago. The important thing I think to note, and this is true for most social media platforms, is that most of their users are outside of the US. So you wanna keep that in mind when you see big numbers because the big number only tells a part of the story. Also in terms of are young people using LinkedIn? That's often a question. Um, and they are, that number has increased. 51% of US college grads use LinkedIn. So that can be great if you're looking um, for interns or people who just graduated, or if you're just out of college or you're still in college, that number is good to know. Uh, and in terms of influencers, um, level, they're all on LinkedIn as well. I think the big thing that most of you are interested in for today is that more than 95% of recruiters use LinkedIn regularly. So um, the 17 million number here, you're wondering what that is, that's senior level decision makers. And these numbers, by the way, are available for Omnicore. Um, um, they update their numbers regularly. Okay, so the other question is, well, Yumi, how popular is this platform with journalists? So I did a little research. It's harder to find those numbers. As Rebecca pointed out yesterday, if you joined that session, you'll know that Twitter remains the most popular platform for journalists. But it is interesting to note that after Twitter and after Facebook, LinkedIn is up there um, with 26%. And I think the other important thing to note in terms of stats is that that number is going up. So um, journalists cited Twitter as the most valuable, but LinkedIn ranked in third with five times the number of journalists from previous years. So question, how do you stand out? Bottom line is it's going to be, well, it's gonna be that first impression. And so this data point is from LinkedIn stats themselves. LinkedIn data shows you only have five to 10 seconds to impress a potential employer online. So that means whatever you put at the very top or the thing that's most visible is going to matter the most. LinkedIn data shows that you get 20 times, 21 times more views and nine times more connections with just, just by adding a photo. And unlike other platforms, I think the one thing that LinkedIn people would say and, and people who've been training, uh, doing LinkedIn uh, workshops like this one would say is LinkedIn is a unique platform because it is really for that professional mindset. So the photo that you choose should be shoulder level and above it should show your face, um, you know, think of it as that first, if you were to have a kind of a preliminary interview, that's kind of what recruiters would like to see. Um, the one thing I will say in terms of photos, if you are an outdoor photographer, um, let's say that you cover um, the environment, I have seen successful profiles where the person is in that world showing that through their headshot or their photo. So I don't, so I do recommend, um, you know, different types of photos if it really captures who you are. Also, um, also pointed out with other platforms like Twitter is this space, um, I call it the cover photo, it's called the wallpaper, the background, but it's that image that allows recruiters and others to quickly see who you are. Um, in this spot, um, you can see that you can add things like inspiring quotes, your achievements, maybe you won an award recently. I've seen folks add like the, the shot from the Emmys if they won that, work life, um, vacation spots, people, places, and things that are important to you. Because ultimately what they're seeing is that full package within five to 10 seconds that tells your story. Another thing, and I think this is a thing I'm gonna be spending time on today, two things I'm gonna spend time on today, um, the headline and the summary. And a lot of people think of the headline as your job title. 
it, they think, well, if I'm a student, I'm just going to put student in the headline, or if I'm working, uh, let's say, as an assistant producer, that's what I'll put in the headline. The problem with that approach is the algorithm already knows that you are an assistant producer or that you are a student because you've input that information into, uh, into other sections. So it doesn't really help in terms of being discovered. Now on LinkedIn, recruiters are gonna discover, discover you not by name, but by the key words you use in certain places. So I wanna give you some examples of headlines that could work for you. Um, so here on the left, I don't know if it's your left, but you'll see um, author, journalist, screenwriter, and advocate. So what Eleanor is doing is she's using keywords. So if we think right back to the Google search, the optimization SEO, if you use a combination of keywords that represent who you are and who you aspire to be, those keywords go into the algorithm and that help uh, in terms of, let's say a recruiter is looking for someone who has screenwriting skills, someone who's been a journalist, someone who's been an author. So that's one recommendation I would have. Now on the other side, you see that Eileen has done something different, which I also recommend, which is that you talk a little bit about the things that you do, but then you add something unique. So here she writes, licensed social worker, journalist, and author of Smacked, a story of white collar ambition, addiction, and tragedy. She also puts in the keywords, Random House and February 2020, to let people know like this is new. I would say, I would probably leave out Random House February 2020 only because you can put that in your um, description down below and it would still come up high in search results. But these are the two options that I think that work well. And again, it's not because someone has found your profile, but you're really targeting the people who haven't found you yet. And the best way to do that on LinkedIn is by filling in those keywords in your summary and in your headline. And this is the headline part. So I hope that you're starting to think about, okay, what do I have as my headline right now? And what do I need to add? So this is what I suggest. Before you write, you should know your UVP, your unique value proposition. And what does that mean? Okay, so first your value is what are you best at? Now, as journalists, we, you know, if everyone in the room is a journalist and we all just said, we're really great journalists, the problem is the algorithm wouldn't be able to weigh that, right? Let's say a recruiter is looking for someone who is an amazing um, sports writer. So again, if that's what you love to do and you've done it well, sports should be something that is part of your unique value proposition. What, who do you serve? This is your audience. So thinking about, am I trying to reach a mass audience? For example, a national audience, maybe my audience is more like a New York Times audience. Or am I really trying to target between 18 to 29 year olds? Or am I targeting Gen Z? I think it's important to understand your, your audience, even though you're on a very professional, um, a platform that's skewed to an older demographic, the demographics break down in terms of what they want to see. So thinking about your audience, and then last, what do you do uniquely and how do you do it uniquely? So value, audience, and unique um, you know, purpose. So for me, what I realized about myself is, yes, I'm a journalism professor. Yes, I've been a journalist. Um, but I really started to think about what is the narrative, right? What if somebody stopped me or I stopped somebody and said, hey, do you want to know about me in 11 seconds? What would I say? And I guess what I really came up, up with was that I would say that I try to help the next generation of storytellers and that I want to encourage more people to, to love this thing we call journalism. So if each of you were to think about what you do and what you truly believe in that makes you different from your peers and your colleagues, I think those are the things that you wanna think about when you're writing your headline. 
And remember, it is not a job title and it should be punchy and solution oriented. Again, if you have five to 10 seconds to impress someone, what are those things that you would say right up front to get their attention, to let them know you're different? So here are some examples. Journalist with a marketing mindset. So again, this is a keyword and that then you add a tagline. And a tagline in the sense just means, you know, what's that thing you would say that makes you unique or different? Here's another one. Marketing professional with an entrepreneurial mindset and a knack for storytelling. Senior advancement and comms professional fighting for sexual assault survivors and patients' rights. Government relations expert advocating for American Indians and social justice. So these are just some examples when I've worked in different workshops that the attendees themselves have come up with and then ended up using or are um, editing and making their own. So with that, let's begin an exercise. So I'd like each of you to take a couple of minutes to go ahead and look at what you have on your LinkedIn profile. Now, I have worked with a lot of people who don't feel comfortable making the direct change to LinkedIn. So what I would encourage you to do is if you have a notepad handy or you just have a Word um, document, a Google Doc open, you don't have to do this on the LinkedIn platform, but look at what you have currently and take a couple of minutes to craft a new headline. And I'm gonna go back to the um, model that I have here sorry, moving forward. Um, I'll leave this up as you work a couple of minutes and then when you feel ready, if you could share that in the chat box, then we could share a couple of those ideas with everyone. So I'll let that start. It is now 9.19. So maybe come back at 9.21 or so. And I do see, as you're working on your, um, I do see some questions. Mm -hmm. Is the headline, the sentence right below your name? Yes, it's the thing that people would see whether you're on mobile, laptop or desktop very quickly. So it really is part of your name. Um, you, you know, in terms of characters, you, you know, you can see that people are using certain characters um, to kind of create that separation between keywords. Um, and yeah, you can use those um, characters. And my youth, um, unique value proposition, it did have um, the tagline, my earlier one, I've actually changed my headline because I like to change it uh, every so often. But yes, it was encouraging the next generation of storytellers. Uh, and Patrick has added a headline. So I'm going to go ahead, Patrick, um, experienced aerospace reporter helping national security professionals stay ahead of their competition. That's a really good one. Now, I have a question. I, I was going to add. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead, Beth. I was just going to say, I'm going to add Patrick's to the chat. So, oh, cool. um, so that everybody. Am I not on the chat? This is in the, uh, it's posting in the Q&A area, oh, but that's okay. We're okay. on board now, so that's good. Okay, cool. Okay, I see it now. So I, I guess, I'm, it, it's, Beth, it's okay for me to start looking at these sure. headlines and talk. Absolutely. Okay, cool. So with the, with the really, I mean, uh, Patrick, uh, experienced aerospace reporter is that Keyword, those keywords tell me that someone's got experience, they do aerospace, so that's awesome. And he's, and your reporter, bringing business intelligence. Now, so are you doing sponsored um, uh, ad kind of um, 
what type of news do you do, Patrick? And then I'll let you answer that. Um, I'm gonna go to another one. Journalist, sustainable development, consultant, boots on the ground. I love that. Syria, Iraq, and Africa. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's really a nice headline. Um, it has so many keywords that will definitely um, kind of stand out in terms of what, it, you know, if recruiters are looking for um, people who have covered certain areas. And then it also shows that you have journalism experience, but you also have that flip side consulting experience. That's great. Um, news. Okay, so Patrick does news about platforms and programs, budgets and funding. The, um, I'd love that. I, I, I think one thing I would add to is um, when you say reporter, people are going to think in the traditional sense of what you do. So if you're skills and if you're interested in other opportunities other than that traditional, I would add a key word um, that indicates that um, you might also be open to like writing of all kinds. And I'm trying to think of like what that might be like a content writer, um, just something where um, recruiters from um, non-traditional companies could know that you would be interested in hearing from them as well. Keywords like Benjamin here, filmmaker, editor, storyteller, actor is excellent. And the one thing is because it's so short and you have two lines of valuable real estate on LinkedIn, I would definitely encourage you to add a little bit more. So keep the filmmaker, editor, storyteller, actor, but tell me a little bit more about the kinds of films you make, the kinds of acting that you like to do. If you've been in a production recently, you definitely have the real estate um, to add those keywords to your headline. Uh, Bailey has written um, broadcast journalist, video producer, web writer, aspiring de to develop unscripted documentaries and game shows. I love it. Um, the only thing I would do here is I would go broadcast journalist, video producer, web writer, comma, lowercase, aspiring, uh, um, aspiring to develop. I would change the word develop to aspiring to create or produce something a little bit, that verb should be stronger, but I love the unscripted documentaries because that's unique and game shows. Um, okay, communications professional and government making data science accessible to the public. Wow, you guys are killing it, okay. Um, I should like copy and paste these and <laughs> use this for my next presentation. Um, excellent, uh, this is mine, okay. Experienced multitasking journalist, love it, it's unique. Food editor, travel editor, editor in chief, grammar guru, copy editor, and compelling writer. This is from Raina, really impressive. The one um, thing I might take out is editor in chief. And the only reason is that in the algorithm, um, the position that you had as editor in chief will already show up in the under job description. And what I also realized from my, my own experience a couple years back, and I was still at LinkedIn at this time, I had become a board president and I thought, well, I'm gonna add it to my headline. Why not, right? The only problem was, is it apparently limited my, um, I guess it was so narrow that there are so few presidents, I guess, it limited all of the job, um, jobs, like my job, you know how you get those jobs that say, oh, if you're interested in this job, all of a sudden um, that pool went from so many different types of jobs that people were kind of hitting me up for to very few. And I actually contacted LinkedIn's help desk. I'm like, what, what happened? They go, oh yeah. It's like when you put CEO or president in your headline, it, um, it does something to the algorithm to make it seem like, well, you would only be, uh, you know, open to these like few opportunities. So I immediately took it out and my search results in terms of job opportunities um, became full again, because I loved seeing the, the cool thing about LinkedIn is that as you update your headline and your summary, and as you make your profile stand out and you add these keywords, you can immediately see whether it's working or not because all you have to do is go to the job listings and what shows up for you. 
And you can tell like, huh, I really wanted social media to show up in the kinds of jobs I was getting, but nothing is showing up. That means you have to go back to your profile and you have to make changes. Yeah, okay, so a question came up about, would you add the French speaking there? Africa was, was um, West Africa, for example. Um, Flavius, do you uh, mean, um, do, do you mean adding uh, language abilities? I'll let you answer that. I'm, wow, there's so many coming in. So I wanna try to, Katie, senior news producer. I love the way, Katie, you've added um, where you are in the ranking, because that matters to people. Um, they want to know very quickly, like, do you have 10 years, 11, 15, and so on. Now, I will say to you, the algorithm also adds your jobs. So let's say you want to put 25 plus years, you know, somewhere in your summary. The reality is you don't really have to because the algorithm is counting every job that you've listed and they count those years up and they then determine this person has 14 years of experience and so on. Um, journalists working at the intersection of news and human impact, like that. Storytelling, live, breaking news, documentaries, and podcasts. One thing, Katie, I would say is when you get to the intersection of news and human impact, I think I would remove storytelling. I would just have the intersection of news and human impact and I might push a little further if I were doing a one-on-one -on -one with you, I might say, what does human impact look like? Give me an example. And if you could in a keyword or two, add it. I, I would probably um, encourage you on a one-on-one -on -one to do that. Edward wrote crisis management expert, journalist and author of award-winning crisis ahead, rated one of the best crisis management books of all time by book author. Authority. Now, I will say you have repeated crisis three times, and while typically SEO would favor the repetition of keywords, um, I, I think from a like reading it out loud, I might just do journalist and author, lowercase author, journalist and author of award-winning crisis ahead rated one uh, crisis ahead. And then I do a period. So I would definitely, I, I think you have all the keywords there. I think this one is about shaving it just a tad bit. Uh, Linda, journalism educator, instructional designer, and e-learning expert, like it. Um, David, experienced and versatile written word journalist with a focus on entrepreneurship, placemaking, livability, oh, and powder snow. I love that. This, that's the other thing people don't remember. Like they think LinkedIn's so hard and you have to be so serious. But uh, while I was working at LinkedIn, what I learned very quickly from the C-suite was um, because everything is so standardized on LinkedIn in terms of you filling out your platform, even C the CEO and everyone, everyone made it a point from a PR perspective to make sure that each person was also talking about things they love to do when they're not working because it really is the whole you. Remember, even though LinkedIn is a professional network, it's still a social platform. People wanna to get to know the real you. So I love the addition of the powder snow. And okay, I have a lot more and I wanna kind of stay on track because I wanna talk about summaries. So um, maybe, yeah, communicator and strategist with deep experience in transportation technology. Yeah, you guys are doing this right. So translator of the complex, wow. Okay, for now, I'm gonna say that all of, you know, the ones I've read and I'm reading, you've done it well. The key thing is you didn't put in where you are currently. You didn't put in like the position that you have, because again, those things are gonna show up in different parts of your profile. And yeah, it was just a repetition, okay. Okay, there is a question that came up I'd like to answer, um, which is, I'm just getting out of college and don't want to limit myself to what I really want to do on LinkedIn to recruiters. What do you recommend? Very great question. Um, so if you're not sure or if you're open to various opportunities, um, what I might do is keep it broad, like some of the headlines that we've read, where you are a storyteller. Um, if you've covered different platforms, like you've done radio, and maybe you've done television, and maybe you've done um, traditional print, 
I do think adding certain key words like that, like radio reporter or multimedia digital storyteller or multimedia storyteller, um, um, you know, excited about, you know, covering, you know, whatever it is. Um, I guess what I would say after reading all these great headlines is this. Now that I see so many great headlines, remember this is also your competition. So as you look at your your the fellow attendees' headlines and see what they're saying, this is actually really good homework because one thing is they're looking for some sense of what your personality is. So if that's something that could help you um, stand out without limiting your opportunities, that might be something to consider. Okay, I am now going to move on unless there's something that somebody wants to ask. Um, Beth, do you see anything that I should address well, I, now? No, I haven't seen anything, but I know we're gonna have another activity. I will just yes. ask the participants, if you can check your chat function to make sure that you're sending your responses to panelists and attendees, there's a little drop down menu, select panelists and, and attendees so everybody can see your great work. Thanks so much for that participation. That was great on um, um, really great um, summaries and headlines. Okay. So now I want to move to another valuable piece of real estate on LinkedIn. And again, if these are the, only, the two things that you just your headline and your summary, you're going to be in great shape because they matter to the algorithm because different sections are weighed differently. Uh, and summary is one of those sections that weighs more heavily when the algorithm, algorithm is saying, okay, this recruiter is looking for a journalist, someone who's done video, someone who's done X, Y, and Z. So let me talk about the summary. So this is a summary that um, Erin Stock, who I don't think I've met, um, she did a couple, uh, like a year ago, and I've used it as an example since then. So I'm gonna read a little bit. And one of the things people ask me, well, Yumi, I thought I had to keep the bio short. No, actually the character, you, you have a lot of space, use the real estate, because again, it's about the keywords you add in your headline and your summary that will help you rise in terms of searches. So Aaron writes, my background includes a mix of journalism and digital communications with a focus on stories that matter. I believe deeply in the power of information and people. Using my skills in reporting, communications and facilitation, I am able to get the story out and engage communities both online and offline more deeply. Like I'm just gonna stop there at paragraph one. Now, who disagrees <laughs> that this is not, I mean, come on, this is a very powerful opening. It's almost as if you were writing a cover letter. And this is the thing I wanna encourage each of you to think about. Does your summary sound like the best ever cover letter that you would have to write, right? If you're applying for a job. Um, and this is just, you know, about me too. It's not just about the people who are not looking or looking. Um, one thing I should say, and I should have said it at the top, is most recruiters are looking for passive candidates. And what that means is they're looking for people who are already happy at their current job or at the projects that they, you know, with the projects that they've done. They're looking for people who are not looking for work. It's crazy, I know. So if you have questions about, should I put in, uh, I'm looking for work in my headline or should I put in, I'm looking for work in my summary, I'm personally gonna tell you no. While it will indicate to people, yes, you're looking for work, there are other ways that you can secretly uh, um, um, tell people you're looking for work. LinkedIn you know, has a, a kind of mechanism that allows you to do that. Otherwise, I would say focus on what you do well, focus on what you've done well, and focus on your aspirations. This opening graph does it really well because Erin could be at ICFJ or she could be at uh, the National Press Club. She could be anywhere. The, the, the place she's at is not important. It's the journey that she's living that is important. So recruiters can come quickly and see, okay, she's got some journalism, she's got some digital comm skills. Um, she is about facilitating. She is about 
engaging community. So that's what I would encourage each of you to do. The other question I often get is, Yumi, should I put in the first line, I have 25 years of experience? No, I would say no, only because again, the algorithm counts up your experience based on the jobs you've written. But more importantly, if you are going to use a metric, let that metric be that you have led dozens of people um, in a project that ultimately won the Pulitzer. Uh, let it be that you have managed a newsroom of 200 employees. Let the metrics be um, things that reveal your leadership without saying that word. Let the metrics be of accomplishments that we all have to kind of stop and say, wow, that's amazing. Um, paragraph two is where Erin goes from general to specific, right? So she goes from the general views on what she does well to here is one of my most exciting projects. So thinking about something that you did last summer, a couple years ago, um, where you can exemplify your leadership, your ability to uh, engage communities, whatever you're saying in your opening, back it up, just as we do in the news business, with a fact. Uh, and this is what she does in paragraph two. And then in paragraph three, I think this is where you can really start to talk about your aspirations or things that you may not be doing at your particular job. I remember working with a group of MBA students. MBA students at this particular university had all been doing great jobs elsewhere. They had been in banking, they had been in uh, you know, great jobs, but they were in the MBA program because they wanted new and very different jobs. So they asked me, Yumi, well, what do I say on my LinkedIn profile? Because you know, all my jobs are about banking. I just got hit up for a banking job. I don't want a banking job. The summary is where you have that opportunity to change your story to create your narrative, to recreate your narrative if you need to. So this is to me that writing where you could say like another passion is of mine is facilitation. I love helping groups meet better and organize a facilitation user group in DC that you should join if you like to improve. So paragraph three is Aaron's ability or effort to let you know, hey, beyond my job titles, beyond what you see, this is what I'm really about. So. If you need someone like that, and she's saying it passively, right? She's not saying, uh, I need you to. And then she's saying, love to help meet groups and organize a facilitation group, but it still feels like a soft appeal. And then four, she says, please reach out if you wanna talk about media innovation, the business of news, facilitation, and the like. Notice she didn't say, please reach out if you have a job. So those are things I would definitely encourage you to think about when you're writing your summary and write, I'm just got, I've got some things that I wanna talk about when you're thinking about summary, write what excites you the most. And here I will say, um, write about your aspirations, write about things that would, wouldn't show up in your job descriptions, especially if you're looking for change. Again, just as we did at the headline, put your job title aside and share what you do and describe the problems you wanna solve or have solved, um, call out your career highlights. So instead of saying, here's what I did at X job, then Y job, and then Z job, don't do that. Don't do the listing because it's already there in the profile. Think about some of the career pivots. Think about those moments that uh, you overcame something or you really made a huge change. And that's what I think should be in that summary. And then relate your outside passions to work if you can. And Erin, I thought did it well. The other thing I would say is, yes, you can write in your links. Um, you know, as Erin did here, she wrote Twitter as an in stock. Now, as you already know, probably most of you know this, that you can't hyperlink it. So it makes it hard because the person then has to copy and paste and then go into another page. But what you can do if you want people to go to other websites or go to other pages is to add links. Um, LinkedIn um, calls it rich media. So there are places in the profile where you can add the link to your story, uh, add, you know, maybe you were in an interview, maybe there's a YouTube um, presentation that you did, whatever it is, you can simply add the link because what happens is when I, let's say I'm a recruiter, 
I see this on your profile, I click on it and I go right, I go immediately to Business Insider. So what really is happening is it's a one-stop shopping center for the recruiter who has, who's pressed for time and maybe looking through a hundred um, applications that day and doesn't want to um, go to four different websites, um, really wants to be at one place. It's kind of like being at Target, right? You shop, you get all your things, and then you quickly know if you want to call this person in for that first interview. Quickly, other things I would recommend, again, to get the most out of spending a couple minutes on LinkedIn is add relevant skills. Because so much of the story that you tell on LinkedIn is your own, there has to be a way for recruiters to know, well, is she really good at copy editing? I mean, she says she is. Is she really good at AP? Does she really know it? When you add relevant skills on LinkedIn, other people can start to endorse those skills. And the more endorsements you get for skills, it helps to rise in a search when a recruiter is looking for someone who's really good at copy editing, knows AP style, and so on. I remember when I was trying to make the change from being a traditional news reporter and print, I was with the Chronicle for 11 years, and then I became a professor, but then as I was getting back into the job market, um, I realized I wanted to be known more for the social media work that I was doing and more for communications. And I realized I actually had to delete some old skills because people kept endorsing me for news writing. Uh, and I realized I needed to add social media as a skill. I needed to add external communications as a skill. So it took some work on my part, but by doing that myself, I could really understand you can change the way people view you on LinkedIn because by adding the skills that you really wanna be known for, getting out there and showing people you're doing those skills, they're gonna naturally want to endorse you as they visit the page. Um, that's going to help you show up as the true expert you are in that area. And don't be afraid or um, shy about asking for recommendations. Those recommendations, once again, serve as a third party um, source or third party verification. Two areas, really, if you think about it, it's skills and recommendations. Those are the two areas, really, the only places where recruiters can see other people saying, oh my goodness. She is an amazing producer. You, you know, you'd be happy to work with her. And again, it's that one stop, like I've got 10 seconds, I'm looking, I wanna know if I put this in the yes pile. And if those recommendations and those endorsements are there, probably gonna go into that yes pile. Now groups, um, there are groups that you can join. And I think the value of groups on any social media platform is that it's a smaller group of people who are more interested in what you are doing. And that can be a great way of networking and of showing what you have to do. Now this article here, um, we can provide you the link. This is in 2020. And I also recommend when you're looking at resources to find out what you should be doing on LinkedIn, be sure the article is new. Um, there are, when you look at a Google search, sometimes the articles that come up high are two, three years old. They will not serve you even though they've come up high. So definitely look for articles that are 2020 or 2021 when you're thinking about what are the steps that I need to make changes on my LinkedIn profile. Okay, so now I want you to spend a couple of minutes thinking about what you would change to your summary. Now I used to, depending on what kind of workshop I'm doing, I would have people like work on their summaries, but that is an intense process. It usually can take hours or sometimes days for people to really make those changes. So I'm not gonna have you do that. But I would like you to think about three things that you would add or change about your LinkedIn summary. Now, this could be maybe you are in third person right now. The example I showed you was in first person and that definitely is the best practice right now, which is that you tell your story in a, in a personalized, way, which is I. Um, so maybe that's a change that you would make. Maybe you would add something that you did last summer that you really are proud of. Maybe you would change it from what you've done to what you want to do to really think about the aspiration. So I'd love to hear what you would change on your pro on your in your summary, particularly. However, if you've also learned that maybe you need to go back and add more skills, I'd love to see that also that you 
you know, let me know in the chat box um, what you might do to change your profile overall. So we'll take a couple minutes and we'll get started on that. Yumi, we do have a couple of questions that might help people as they work through this exercise. Okay. Um, Lisa asks, is there value in including awards you've won in your summary or headline, or does that show up in the algorithm in other ways? Wait, say that again. Sorry. Is there value in including awards that you've won in your so summary or headline, or does that show up in the algorithm in some way? If you have listed awards under the award section, excellent. However, I do believe there is a value in your summary or your, let's say you just won the award. This to me is really important that you go immediately to your LinkedIn profile. Let's say that you won, um, uh, you know, an Emmy and you just got it like a couple days ago. This is where I would go to my headline and I would say, you know, journalist, storyteller and um, a Emmy, you know, a Emmy award winner. What I would do in three months from now, though, or in a couple months from now, I would take that out. So I wouldn't want that to be like in my headline for a year. The other place I would put that is, you know, I recently won an Emmy for a project that I did, blah, blah, blah. So I essentially would use my summary and headline as the, this kind of living and breathing document of my progress as I'm going on. And remember, recruiters are probably looking at you not just once, not just twice, they're probably following you, right? If they're interested. So as you make your changes, what I like about the LinkedIn profile is I don't have to tweet it out that I just won an Emmy. I mean, you can do that too, right? But, but I love it because it's a place where I can add it. It's not an announcement, but recruiters who are consistently kind of checking out, um, you know, potential hires, they can say, oh, you, you know, she just won an Emmy recently. Oh, she has a new project or she has a new book. So that's where I would add it. Excellent. We have one other question that has come up um, and I, you, you touched on it earlier, but just for clarification, uh, Nancy asks, how many years of experience, if any, should you include in your summary? So I have talked to different groups um, and the, their concern, there are many concerns, right? Ageism is a, is a, is a true concern. Um, so depending on that concern, you should add it or not, right, in your summary. If you don't want 25 years of experience to be part of the focus um, and you want to be considered for, let's say you're changing markets or changing industries. I remember when I was um, getting into uh, the LinkedIn world, I mean, all my years of experience really didn't matter. Well, it mattered to some degree, but I just didn't have a lot of experience in social media or technology. Um, so what I would say is, if you believe that saying I've had 25 years of experience is gonna be important to senior level positions that you're interested in, absolutely. I don't think you need it. I think that you could make a case in an opening that says, you know, you're basically saying, um, I have done, you know, numerous, you know, I've held numerous positions that have allowed me to lead and innovate and change. That to me would be more appealing because now we're not simply talking about years of experience. We're talking about what you think you've done well in this 25 years, knowing that you really don't have to put it in because it's in that, it's in that algorithm in terms of what you've done. Um, but it also really focuses on, it doesn't, it allows us to focus on what you do as opposed to how long you've done it. I hope that makes sense. I think that's it for questions right now, but there are some great, um, great thoughts on what people would like to. Um, okay, do you want to show them? I, for some reason, I can't see them. Oh no, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, okay. So from Bailey, um, who, who says that he wants to add uh, add my aspiration in creating reality game shows, clean out information that's already on my resumes, highlight video production experience over journalism, yes. and make it lighter, funnier to match the fun energy of the job I want. I love that. I love that. Um, it's that kind of, if you were to make those changes, 
anyone, um, a recruiter, um, a conference organizer who's looking for a speaker, they would start to see who you really are. Uh, and so I encourage those changes. And the other thing I would say, I'm glad you pointed out, it's Bailey, right? Um, is shedding, you know, is trimming, is carving, is sculpting. We probably have, um, each of us in this room, you know, in the rooms that we are in, probably have a lot of experience in different things. But the question is, what do you want to highlight? What do you want people to stop and focus on? Um, so shedding, I think, is a great, great thing to do. David and Jean both reference skills. David says he wants to go in and add more specific skills. And Jean mm -hmm. says she needs to uh, delete ancient technical skills like Flash. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you um, are getting endorsements for Flash and, and that, you know, is an outdated. Um, and you, here's what happened to me. There, you can list up to 99 skills. And I, believe it or not, had 99 skills because people kept in, you know, when it first came out, I think a lot of people were um, of the mindset, let's get involved. Let's start, you know, endorsing people for skills. I actually had to delete those um, other skills um, that I felt were repetitive, first of all, but also just did not embrace the new me, like the, the, the positions that I wanted to get hired for or, or noticed for. So yeah, I would delete some skills. Now the key is though, I, I question, I guess, is if you have a lot of endorsements for that skill, um, then it's like a bummer because then, you know, you've gotten kind of third-party verification. A lot of people are saying you can do this well. So one thing I would say is as you delete skills and you add new skills, think about ways that you might encourage your network to help endorse you. I, I recently heard from um, a graduate of SS State, Giselle Fernandez, who interviewed me for her podcast, which I had never heard of. She calls me and she's like, hey, can you do this podcast? And so she interviewed me and then she sent me the recording um, for this podcast. And I listened to it and I, and I was blown away by not only the great auto, audio editing that she did, um, I realized her questioning had been really great because it drew me out. And so I immediately went to her profile and endorsed her um, for things that I thought she did well. But then she reached out to me and she said, hey, Yumi, could you endorse me for interviewing? And it, you know, I didn't even cross because those weren't the skills I first saw. And of course I said, yeah, I mean, she did such a great job. Uh, and yeah, so definitely be open to people who ask for endorsements, but also don't be shy to say to someone, you know, I just had this experience with you. Would you endorse me for interviewing? And she did. And I said, absolutely. I didn't think about it because it didn't, it wasn't on the top of her skills. You mean that's so interesting. Uh, Flavius asked earlier and it fits so well now, you know, with regards to asking for those skills recommendations, would you, pro would you recommend providing suggested content, like doing a hard ask for, can you endorse me on this specific skill? Um, or would you let the person decide what to write? I think, okay, um, that's a complicated question, <laughs> but I, um, let, me, let me boil it down and hopefully I answer this. But just as Giselle asked me for, to endorse her in interviewing, clearly that's what she wants to become known for more. Um, I would say, yes, if you, um, like when I was doing, when I, when I was working at LinkedIn and I was trying to build up like my credibility as a social media trainer, I definitely went to people after, but I only did it after I presented. So after a presentation, um, I would say, would you endorse me for social media or, or for training LinkedIn? And I only did that after I exemplified or did the, did, you know, the thing that I said, could you endorse me for it? So I think that's the key. Like if you've done something and you know people have seen that, you know, that you've done it, like you've written a story, then say, would you endorse me, you know, to your editor or something? If it is that you would create it for them, it, so if it's manufactured, I don't know if I would do that. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Okay, okay. Absolutely. And I, you know, Yumi, I'm looking at the clock. It's already 12.56 our time. Uh, oh, it's so time. We are, we are running out of time. Um, okay. So any last minute thoughts or suggestions before we um, wrap up? 
Well, this has just been such a pleasure. You can see like so much, there's so much that you can do on the LinkedIn platform. And the one thing I would say, it's not intuitive like some of the other platforms. And that's why taking a training like this, taking a workshop, um, going online um, to check out best practices, which are constantly changing as the platform changes, um, definitely is worth your time. You will get so much out of it because um, unlike other platforms, where it's about content also, um, by building up your LinkedIn profile and having that be your living, breathing document of the accomplishments and the changes and the aspirations, I think you will see um, results and start to see the kind of results you want. Yubi, thank you so, so much. We're, we're incredibly awesome. grateful for your time and your expertise. And there's so much more I know you could share with us, but time, time limits us today. Um, I don't know about our guests, but I know I have a lot of serious work to do on my LinkedIn. Um, to our guests, can you just stay, stay tuned for just a few more minutes? Um, we have a couple of questions for you. We want to know how today's workshop will help you. Yes. I'm putting in the chat a, a prompt. I'd love for you to complete this sentence. Because of this program, I dot, dot, dot. So please share um, what you'll take from this program, what you'll, um, how you'll apply it. And that will be great. Um, as you do that, I'm going to remind you, you will receive a recording of this program along with a, a survey that we'd like for you to fill out. You're going to get an email this afternoon. Please take a few minutes to check out the recording, of course, and go back over these fantastic tips and uh, take just a few minutes. It should take less than three minutes to fill out the survey. Um, it is very helpful for us as we continue to create and improve programs that will help you in your career search or with different skills that you're interested in learning. Um, and as uh, this week's programs have been made available at no cost to you and other participants, we hope that you might consider a donation to the Institute um, to help us continue to provide services like this. I'm going to drop a link in the chat uh, if, in case you're interested in doing that. And last but not least, we hope to see you tomorrow for um, same time, same place for revving up your resume, uh, practical tips for reframing your work so that it um, can grab a recruiter or employer's eyes. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Wilson, and to our guests for joining us. And we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Really fun spending an hour with you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.